The National Ethics and Integrity Policy was developed by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, ICPC, in collaboration with the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and the National Orientation Agency, NOA, in response to the many damaging effects of corruption in both the public and private sectors. The policy on national orientation was developed with a view to help restore and revitalize the public and the private sectors while enhancing values and integrity and tackling areas of corruption in Nigeria. The policy obligates all Nigerians and everyone who resides within the borders of Nigeria or who relates with the country in one form or the other to commit to upholding the following core values of human dignity, voice and participation, patriotism, personal responsibility, integrity, national unity and professionalism. How aware and committed are Nigerians to policies and values concerning national orientation? Today on the program, we shall be looking at the policy on national orientation and how it affects Nigeria and Nigerians. Thank you for joining us. I am China Ejoga. Up next is News Update. Stay with us. The National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, NIPS Kuru, has organized a three-day capacity building orientation workshop for Directorate of Studies and Research Directorate ahead of the 2024 Senior Executive Course Program. The program, which took place at the Political Parties Leadership and Development Center Department of the Institute, was meant to enhance proper coordination and synergy between the two directorates for the success of the Institute's mandate. While addressing the staff, Navy Commodore Obaje MNI said the SEC program is a responsibility for all and urged the staff to put more effort in order to ensure participants' welfare and general improvement of the SEC program. Dr. Raza, on one or two occasions or three occasions, he brings what, what he feels, what he feels is in the interest of the study group or something that he observes that we could do to make it easier for this uh, participant to be able to assimilate and perhaps uh, uh, get into the course proper. And such, I want to bring it forward to the senior DS, uh, Professor Ika, I think we're passing that on this course. We're able to address those issues. Uh, normally, a, mem a member of that study group today is a, was a DS and sitting here. He knows. And that's another that way we'll be able to move our uh, uh, study group forward. So please, welfare issues should not only be left in tears. Bring it forward in this course and do things together. Comments, views, issues, and challenges were raised and addressed during the brainstorming session. While delivering his presentation on designing a research, the head public affairs department Professor Shola Adeyanju, MNI, said, Research is an integral part of academic process, which is used to increase understanding between people, cultures, and societies. We have research strategy, and then we have research design. So the research strategy is like the broad approach that you want to use. Then you have the research design, and then the types of research design. That's what I'm going to explain very quickly. You know, uh, your, I mean, DOS used to say this, that there is nothing like one being important than the other between quantitative and qualitative. It depends on what you want to do and your research. Members of the staff spoke on the relevance of the orientation workshop on the staff and the flagship program. Uh, basically, we have to understand the fact that uh, the backbone of every research is, is research methodology. And when we get the research methodology right, then we are able to get the research right. And if that is the case, this workshop is a refresher workshop. It is not a new thing to us. But again, there are ideas, there are new ideas that have come out to play. 
So you realize that we need this refresher course from time to time. So this would enable each and every participant here, the directing staff and the fellows, or particularly the senior fellows, to guide the participants appropriately. So I'm well equipped, I'm better informed, you know, to provide logical supervision to the, to the senior executive course participants of 46, 20, 24. First, I want to start with the fact that knowledge is not static. Changes as the world is evolving. We're in the era of uh, artificial intelligence now. So, the most we brought, uh, most we are pressed with what is going on. The um, orientation capacity building program is what we do every year to prepare all uh, members of the faculty, that is, the uh, director of uh, studies and the uh, director of research, to be ready in all respects for the participants who are coming fresh. We are having uh, members of the uh, Institute of 46 now. The Institute, as the Apex Policy Formation Center, deems it fit to give members of its staff updated information about the activities of the 10-month ex senior executive course ranging from local and international study tours, plenary sessions, crisis games, and presidential parley reports. Vaku Ambi, reporting for NIPS Policy TV. For staying with us if you're just joining us this is policy focus now back to our topic the policy on national orientation amongst other things was designed to imbibe the and embody core values among nigerians it's to help the country reach national development goals as the meaning of national purpose is reframed it's also to save the country from the ongoing erosion of ethics and collapse of value to encourage patriotism and to open up ongoing dialogue to refine behaviors and characters and to bring out the best in Nigerians. So to shed more light on the topic on, of our discussion today, I have Mr. Job David Ayuba, who is CEO, Tom Rook, IHUB Multiverse. So it's great to have you on the program. Hello there and thanks for joining us. This is Policy Focus. As we have been discussing earlier, I have a professional or an analyst who would throw more light on the topic that we are looking into today. And that is none other than Mr. Job David Ayuba, who is CEO of Tom Rook IHOP Multiverse. So it's great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. So, sir, so let's delve right in. The National Orientation Agency was created with the aim of communicating government policy, promoting patriotism, and providing a feedback channel to the government. Sir, in your own view, what is your general appraisal of the agency's performance in the incumbent government in relation to its mission? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Like you said, the National Orientation Agency has the mandate of communicating policies, activities, and programs of government. Um, it also has the mandate of promoting patriotism, you know, amongst Nigerians. Um, in my own view, I believe that the agency has performed spectacularly well, especially in the context of the resources made available for it to perform um, the onerous task of communicating government policies, programs, and activities. Um, now, if you want to communicate government programs and activities, we need to first understand that government exists in three levels and are three layers. Three levels in a democratic dispensation is executive, legislative, and judiciary. Then the three layers are federal, state, and local governments. Well, you know, a lot of times people only hold the federal government accountable without knowing that it's also the responsibility to hold state and local governments accountable. Mm. Um, now, inside of this structure that I just described to you, you will find several ministries, departments, and agencies, you know, at the federal, at the state level, and at the local government level. All of these are working to provide policies, 
activities and programs that benefit the citizens. And this was the major reason why the National Orientation Agency was structured along that line, you know, with offices at federal, state, and local governments. So they have offices at the federal level, offices in every state, and offices in every local government. You know, so you, be, you can begin to imagine that onerous task that the agency is supposed to achieve. You know, the task is huge, very huge, you know. Now, what resources, what kind of resources should be provided to an agency saddled with this kind of task to perform the expectation of all stakeholders? So if you examine what the agency has been doing against you know, a research outcome with the real-time resources that goes to the agency, then you will find your, your answers and understand why I said within the context in which the agency is operating, it is performing excellently. In recent time, the agency has been under attack for being unable to meet her statutory objectives in view of security and social vices confronting our nation. What is your take on that, sir? Well, um, those who attack the agency are not well informed and do not have critical minds. You know, I've engaged with a lot of people and had to get them to understand um, the operations and the challenges of the agency. To become well informed, you need to just do your research. You know, if an agency's performance does not meet your expectations, we can start by asking why it has not done that, you know, by doing some research. Anybody can go online and find, you know, the budget of that organization and see whether in today's realities, that budget is enough to implement the, the programs or the mandate of that organization, you know. So if you look at an organization like NOA, NOA has this in everybody's business. It means that the business of the Ministry of Health is NOA's business. Yeah. The business of the Ministry of Agriculture is NOA's business. The business of the security agencies is NOA's business. But guess what? NOA is domiciled in the Ministry of Information, mm -hmm. which means it draws its budget from the Ministry of Information, which also means that the Ministry of Health will not take the money for sensitization, for advocacies, for ed health education, and give to another ministry. So you see that NOA has a big challenge. Yeah. But people expect the National Orientation Agency mm -hmm. to, sensitize, to, to sensitize them on health. Oh. But they are not getting any resources either from the Ministry of Health to do that job. So you see, you see where the, where the issue is. Um, the budget of the organization is online. As I speak with you right now, we are going into March, but resources have not been released to the agency to implement any programs this year for any sensitization this year. And the first quarter of the year is almost gone. But people are still expecting the agency to sensitize them on government policies, programs, and activities. Mm. You know, that's why I said people can always go online. People can always reach out to the organization and ask them, why are you, why are you not meeting our expectations? Then when you get that information, you cannot use that to assess them. Okay, so... I want to ask the question in that line. So how, how can the NOA handle this challenge of not getting enough funds and resources to you know, handle their responsibilities? I know one of the things that the new director general or director general of the National Orientation Agency, Malam Larry Isa Unilu is okay. doing, is trying to see how they can get all the resources allocated for, for, for orientation, for sensitization, for education from different ministries, departments, and agencies, 
and get it into the National Orientation Agency so that the National Orientation Agency can do the work that Nigerians are expecting it to do. But of course, that's not a decision that can just happen overnight. It has to pass through, you know, through the executive, it has to pass through legislative processes and get their support and backing before those resources can be moved from these ministries, departments, and agencies to the National Orientation Agency. That is one way to do it. Another way to do it is to go through partnerships, you know, establish partnerships with different organizations, which the National Orientation has been doing, you know, with um, organizations locally and also international organizations, leveraging on the resources that they have, you know, to carry out its, its mandate. You know, and this new director general is already already exploring those paths. Okay, looking at the importance of the agency in bridging the gap between the government and the governed on policies dissemination, can you say our government is underutilizing the agency? Can I say if our government is underutilizing the agency? Yes, the government is underutilizing the agency. Um, but in addition, this government is beginning to explore ways to utilize the agency. And what Mr. President has done is to create, it used to be the Ministry of Information, but it is now Ministry for Information and National Orientation. So what the president has done is elevated the agency a little bit, but not to my expectations. I would have expected the president, Mr. President, to take the National Orientation Agency and domicile it in the presidency. Mm. So one of the reasons I, I, I mentioned earlier that other ministries, departments, and agencies want to do their own work of orienting citizens because they don't want to release the funds for that work to the National Orientation Agency. So the, 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 the president needs to put it, he needs to prioritize national orientation because national perception is very, very important. The agency should have access to information from the presidency real time so that it is able communicate with citizens, you know, and also promote hope, mm. promote hope in these hard times. Okay, I agree with you on that. I would, um, I would also like to ask that our elections are now characterized by religion and tribal sentiments, social divisions, and post-election grievances and inter-party clashes. So which role do you feel the National Orientation Agency needs to play in fighting these challenges or these biases? The National Orientation Agency has a responsibility to promote national cohesion. Mm. If the agency does that effectively, it will deal with the issue of tribal or religious sentiments. But remember, the work of promoting national cohesion is just one part of the solution there must also be a way of holding people accountable when they try to promote divisiveness, to promote chaos, to promote disunity amongst Nigerians. Every way can come and talk. It can promote national cohesion. It can give people reasons why they should, you know, unite, why Nigerians should unite. But what if somebody decides to do Otherwise, yeah. who holds that person accountable? Mm. You see my point? So, yes, NOA has that responsibility. Again, we can begin to look at political parties because political parties also have a huge role to play in, both in, in all of this, in promoting national cohesion because politicians are beginning to use that, this unity for, to their own benefit, right? And if we if we emphasize or if we can hold political parties accountable for voter education and ensuring internal party democracy in the activities, that will help us 
produce credible leadership from the political parties. The kinds of leadership that will promote unity, that will promote peace, that will promote progress amongst Nigerians, right? And like I also said earlier, many times, NOA is held accountable for activities that other organizations are mobilized to do. For example, um, I know you know that INEC does voter education, but it is not, that is not INEC's core mandate. INEC's core mandate is to conduct elections. But INEC also received resources to do voters' education. But Nigerians now ask NOA, what have you done in terms of educating voters in the country? So you see what I mean? Yes. So we have to find, yes, we have to find a way to channel resources to the organization, to this agency that has the mandate to orient and to reorient Nigerians mm. on national issues. Mm. Farmer herder clashes, particularly on the plateau, Benue and Taraba, has been one of the evil posing threats to our national security. What role do you think the National Orientation Agency should play in orientating and reorientating the warring communities on its effects? Okay, so the agency can contribute significantly to mitigating the farmer header clashes, you know, by undertaking targeted orientation and reorientation efforts. Mm -hmm. This means that boots must be on ground. Let me give you a small scenario. Um, if you go and look at the, the budgets of the National Orientation Agency, you will see that, but like six main uh, programs that, that it does sensitize, that it, that it sensitizes Nigeria on, I don't think anyone has a budget of more than 50 or 60 million naira. Now, if you are giving 50 million naira, to find ways to sensitize people to mitigate the farmer header splashes. And you, you share that money amongst 37 states, 36 states, including the FCT, 37, one, one million naira. Imagine each local government, how much we get to each local government to mobilize community uh, mobilization officers. They have comos. So imagine Plateau State is giving just one million naira on this campaign alone. Plateau State has 17 local governments. Divide that 1 million over 17 local governments. How many officers will be required, boots on ground, to go into different communities in just one local government? So you see that the place is underfunded. Hmm. It's highly underfunded. We, don't, we, have not be, we have not been able to match the resources we are giving this organization with the quantity of work that this organization is expected to do. Wow. So yes, yes, the organization can do all of this. It can, it can sensitize on conflict. It can sensitize on cultural and religious and religion. It can, you know, show people other ways of diversifying livelihood. How can the farmer depend on the herder and how can the herder depend on the farmer to coexist to live and be able to create wealth for each other yes it can do all of that but it also needs resources to make that happen mm. the national orientation agency has used so many slogans such as change begin with me if you see something say something and do the right thing to campaign for better nigeria Looking at contemporary Nigeria, what slogan can you say will best fit our situation? Slogan that will best fit our situation. The slogan should capture what Nigerians yearn for. It should capture the hope and expectations of Nigerians. That slogan should be a hashtag for a better Nigeria. Okay, for a better Nigeria. <laughs> Is yes. that all, or you have other options? No option, because even if you say, when you say 
change begins with me. Mm. Or change should begin with me. Why should change begin with you? It's for a better Nigeria. Mm. If you hear something, say something. Mm -hmm. If you see something, say something. Why? For a better Nigeria. Okay. Everybody should work for a better Nigeria. Okay, that's the nice. The entertain for a better Nigeria. The preachers should preach for a better Nigeria. The singers should sing for a better Nigeria. Okay, that's nice. So can you tell us one of the functions, or rather, let's say, one of the functions of the National Orientation Agency is to orient and reorient Nigerians about the about government policies, okay? Apart from using the conventional and non-conventional media, what effort is the agency making to reach the grassroots to educate them about these policies? Remember, I mentioned that the agency has what they call community mobilization officers, mm. COMOS. These are the people who move, who, 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 these are the people in rural communities who move from house to house, from town to town, you know, to communicate some of these policies, um, programs and activities of government. The agency is doing its best to use all means necessary to reach Nigerians. Mm -hmm. But the scale at which it is doing that is what is not impressive. Mm. You know, it has to be escalated. If you have um, 10 people um, going to different communities in the local government, we need to escalate that to 100 people or 200 people mm. doing the same thing. And to do that, some of them might even need motorcycles. Some of them might need public address systems, you know, and so on and so forth. So imagine if you need to buy 774 motorcycles and public address systems for just one officer per local government. What is the cost of that times 774? Imagine you have to multiply the number of people who do the same task. What is the cost of that? So again, everything takes us back to funding and to the resources that is available for them to do this work and how those resources must be reviewed and make sure that these people have enough resources to um, carry out their mandates. It's new, it's fresh. It's all about policies and strategies. Watch out for NIPS Policy TV programs on NTA News 24. Tune in on Mondays, Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on DSTV Channel 419, Go TV Channel 26, Star Times Channels 101 and 433, and Free TV Channel 703. Miss this and miss out on policy policies that will affect you and our country. Join us. agency has a role to play to seeing that uh, this culture are preserved because from what we're seeing the culture are going to extinct but uh, they need to give proper orientation to people they need to go to villages I know when we used to, we used to be small national orientation move around with the um, uh, public address system 
to give orientation to people, to sensitize people about a lot of things. But nowadays, you don't see them again. They don't even, they go on television, you don't see, you don't hear about National Orientation Agency, they don't uh, sensitize people, educate people about anything. So I think it's proper that they uh, do this kind of work. They have to do a lot to see that our our, our culture, our, our languages, tribes are preserved by you know introducing some some of these ideas to the government so that even in our institution schools let's say um secondary schools or beginning from primary school they should introduce some of these languages so that we can be able to preserve if not these languages are going to extinct the country is so large and uh, for it to reach it will take a longer time because so far the, the message is already only conveyed in uh, some major tribes languages and discover that again accessibility to uh, the media is only limited to very few and so you cannot expect that uh, a campaign will reach everywhere within the shortest time and it will take a longer time but it did they are penetrating it gradually really we have a very diverse culture a very large area to cover uh, unlike other nations of the world where you find very few ethnic groups that can be easily managed. But in Nigeria, we are, we are more. And um, I, I feel that there is always a common ground. There's a place where we can meet. One of the challenges we struggle a lot at this point, looking at culture as it were, is that um, we are gradually moving into a stage of what I call mixed culture. Currently, we can boast of having pure cultural heritage in Nigeria. Most of the things we practice are borrowed. So you have the real culture you have, but there are a lot of things that are being, I, well, I don't have more time to put more of the time to see now, but I feel a lot of the things we practice today in the name of culture are being informed by certain things and which is gradually fading away uh, or keeping aside our own personal heritage and um, in other words diluting it with others. So I feel there's a lot of work for this agency to do uh, in order to be able to foster that unity among us. Nigeria has beautiful cultures. We if you see children now, speak language to them, they don't understand. Speak your own tribe to them, they don't understand all these things. So national orientation need to sit up and do better and do more so that uh, these are uh, cultures and uh, languages will be preserved. We have wonderful heritage that can help us work together. In our most that we are, we are really diverse in different ways, but I feel that there is that sense of belonging that if each of us can come, like having the rainbow, having different colors, we can add beauty to this um, country we call Nigeria. So I'm calling on this agency um, to do a lot to do a lot. We need to take, um, there are a lot of eth ethnic groups like you have mentioned, I felt that is not known. What do we do that can be able to bring these people to the limelight such that they would also feel as part of this nation? For example, when you talk about governance, as we were talking earlier, there are people that you never hear their names when it comes to governance. Um, does that mean they are not Nigerians? They are. Uh, if I would call my tribe now, a lot of you will know that. The many will say, we don't know that tribe. <laughs> I am Basa Komu from Kogi State. So I know many people have not heard of this tribe, but we are people walking in the face of Nigeria and we are Nigerians contributing to the well-being of Nigeria. Um, partnership with the relevant uh, stakeholders from the federal state, local government, and private sectors. They need to partner with them to ensure that their messages get across to the right persons. So I believe there are a lot of tribes that if this body will do well, let us find ways to be able to bring things that will bring this culture or these ethnic groups to the limelight, that people can know that ah, we have such beauty. Whatever, I know that there's challenge of management. Follow your dream with passion. Be determined. Leave the rest to God. A 
it's new, it's fresh. It's all about policies and strategies. Watch out for NIPS Policy TV programs on NTA News 24. Tune in on Mondays, Tuesdays, Fridays and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on DSTV Channel 419, Go TV Channel 26, Star Times Channels 101 and 433, and Free TV Channel 703. Miss this and miss out on policies that will affect you and our country. Join us. Hello and thanks for joining us. This is Alumni Chat. I have a guest today and this is none other than Barista Chile Okoroma, SAN MNI. So it's good to have you on the program. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm grateful. Okay. So I would like to ask what brought about you coming to the National Institute? Coming to the National Institute, first of all, I was nominated. Okay. Nominated by my agency to come to the National Institute, but that was not my first time. That was my first time in the, the main course, the, the senior executive course. Mm. But the, I had attended the PSLC course in 2008. That was just for, for one month. So, but this time around, well, this, in, in uh, 2020, I was nominated by my agency to come to to NIPS. Uh, since I was nominated, I didn't, uh, I didn't have an option mm. than to come. Uh, left to me, I would have preferred, when I was nominated, I, 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 it was with mixed feelings because I felt I needed to be in my office going to court, doing what I know how to do. You know, but when I was now sent to NIPS for a whole one year, I won't be going to court, I won't be arguing or preparing my matters or working in the office and doing all those things. I was just going to go as a participant I, I I just had to accept it because I didn't have an option. Uh -huh. But coming there, I thank God I did. <laughs> Let me just for that. Okay. Say I thank so, God I did. So that leads yes. me to the next question, which is, what was your experience while you were a participant? I lost the experiences. The experiences very profound, mm. very exciting. First of all, this is a place. It's a melting pot from people from different sectors. Mm. Yes, people, the public, public and the private sector, people from the military, police from the private sector, coming from the federal government institutions, state government institu uh, institutions. So it was really a place where people interacted. Mm. And that would help to widen my horizon and gave, it gave me a, very, a better understanding of a lot of things. And in fact, it made me to have more respect for our military men. Mm. You know, my, my, my take before, what I was thinking was that all that the soldiers do, all they do is soldiering. But coming to NIPS, I, I just, I, I said, ah. so we just have people, military men, who are so uh, academic minded, so scholarly, very brilliant. They were looking at just how they analyze policies, how they discuss. And it was quite, you know, it, it, helped, it just helped me a lot to have more respect for the people from the military, unlike how it used to be before, mm -hmm. and quite a lot of people. So I've had a lot of experience, you know, I, I, I can go to highlight quite a lot of them. First of all, another thing is that I learned a lot on issue of policies, what policies are, how policies are implemented, what even what uh, how what has what happens to policies the monitoring and everything some of them studying them some of them that didn't work why they didn't work mm. strategies leadership I know I I learned a lot on all this you know, the institutional framework legal framework policy mm -hmm. framework I understood I came to learn so much uh, about all this and also the cross fertilization of ideas from people coming from different backgrounds, mm. you know, gave me better understanding, better perspective mm. of several things. And so, and uh, you know, it also instilled more discipline mm. in me. You know, it's regimented. Yeah. 
So you just coming from a place where you are you are the boss. Here, here you are just a participant. Whatever position you wear in your office, you are you just left them at the gate. You are just like uh, just a student. I just have been ordered about learning how to go to class, wake up early in the morning and do the morning exercise. You know, the, the time we have to go for the 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 the, the breakfast, prepare to go for dinner study uh, uh, group study group uh, discussions then go for the plenary sit there for hours listening to people mm. you know so it, it made me to be more more disciplined in my approach to mm. things and then again also you know we lawyers generally we are very verbose when we <laughs> write things yes we're very very verbose because we want to capture everything you know one simple sentence i i for instance now they say that you say a lawyer an ordinary man can say, I give you this orange. But a lawyer will say, I give you this orange together with all the interest, right, title, <laughs> appurtenances, associated <laughs> to it, to it, uh, or deal with any man that you may deem appropriate. I know I'll go just like that. So you just get as a lawyer. But you see, Nips, now you have what they call economy of frugality of words of words and I, I remember we are told that a, a sentence should not be more than 23 words mm. so when you have trust of writing when you are writing your whatever you are writing you are writing you are taking the sentences you are cutting them knowing how to start your paragraph everything in line <laughs> with the new style manual yeah you know like how you used to be before and also the, i remember what we are we are told say look when you are writing Memos, any memo that you write, any word that you, any memo that you write that will make your boss start looking for dictionary, <laughs> is not a good memo. So wow. I, thank you very much. Wow, it's so exciting to hear this. You were leaving or restating these experiences as if it was just yesterday. So um, yes. how has this experience impacted on your person and your career, sir? You know, thank you very much. I have said that. First of all, my career. It uh, has made me to be more focused and disciplined mm. in whatever I'm pursuing in my career. Mm. When, we, when we came initially, it was quite very difficult. And we, we kept wondering, say, ah, how are we going to get over this? I, I remember I asked, to ask, uh, I asked uh, our then uh, one of our study, directing staff and i asked him sir i said ah, this thing how did you people get through it it's difficult and this this uh, course and he said he told me say what, say what course is your own and say our own is uh, 42 2020 mm -hmm. so he said he said look 42 people 41 people have passed through this and they succeeded so if you if they succeeded you also can succeed mm -hmm. so you have to pursue it with vigor yes. and determination and don't give up so it's also so that helped me that whatever I am doing in my career, it's not even practicing law, it's not easy. At times you have to walk around the clock the way it was nips. Most times you just all that you needed, you walk, you stay in the study, uh, study uh, group uh, classes for for throughout the whole job, you do attend your, your lectures in the day all through the night, you bachelor through the night, you only go to your room to clean up and then prepare for the presentation. So with that, you know, that mindset, that attitude, that discipline, there's hardly anything I cannot do in my pro. Even if it requires, you know, walking all through the day, walking all through the night, mm. because I know that I will be successful at the end of the day. So mm. it has also helped me, you know, on how to even make presentation mm. before people, because we also thought about that. I remember it was uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the secretary and director of administration, okay. um, Dr. Uh, Brigadier General Odaga. Oda, 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 Oda. <laughs> Sorry, if I <laughs> told, say, look, he told us, say, look, there's no person, and I remember it every time. Odaya, yes, Brigadier Odaya. I said, yeah. look, there's no person who doesn't suffer from stretch, stage fright. He said, you have to, he said, the thing sank down. Mm. Say there's no person who, but first of all, you have to talk to yourself. 
that you are able to do it. The training I had in NIPS has helped me to know what the things to remove and still make very cogent and uh, very strong points. Mm. So that's just it has helped me quite and then in other ways and also how to relate with people. Yeah. Be able to tolerate the shortcomings of other people. So more, yes, I was working in a place like that in AFCC. I've been there for years. I've related with people from different backgrounds, from different religions. So, and then also in lips, also that helped me the more. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so you really, yes. you really, really said enough. And um, I want to ask, what are your principles in life? My principles in life, first of all, somebody should try and be of good character. Of good character, be a person of uh, integrity. Be a person of integrity. A man, a person you take his words for his words, take him for his words, person you take for his words. A person that is not, uh, is not, uh, is, is, is truthful, a person who is truthful, who is honest, who is transparent. Let it be that. As you are looking at me, and you are chilling, chilling, chroma, chilling, chilling. That's all, chilling, chroma. You see, you don't everything you see. You are contact with that's all you, I am. That's what you know, about, and that's what I am. So you don't come, and tomorrow you see a different person. Mm -hmm. You know, it is like a chameleon who, who changes color. No, it's not like that. I should be able to tell you, say, look, this is how it is, and you go away saying that this is how it is because Mr. Chile told you this is that this is how it is. These are my principles, and then also faithfulness mm. in life. Faithfulness even to your employer, faithfulness to your spouse, faithfulness to your friends, colleagues, faithfulness to people you come into contact with. Mm. These are my principles and love and care and the fear of God. Through this, all your growing up and upbringing, and now as you're a son, who are your mentors and why? Who are my mentors and uh, why? Growing up, first of all, my parents were my mentors. Okay. My mother, my mother in particular. Mm. My mother was a, a disciplinarian to mm. the core. The values that my, my parents inculcated in me, they have carried me through life. Mm. I will tell you a story. When I went many, many years ago, when I was in secondary school, I gave my book, I think it was Julius Caesar, to one of my cousins to use. And then when he got to school, he lost it or it was stolen. Mm -hmm. And then he, he came back, when he came, one day after I asked him for the thing, he couldn't find it. One day he brought one to me, another person's own. And to tell you, I just kept it. I said, what's my business? You took my book, you brought another book for me. That's my business, my business, none of my business. One day, my mother saw the book and asked me, who owns this book? And I told her, because one thing my mother responded, the things my mother loved and respected me for was I always told her the truth. And I told her, I said, look, I didn't tell her, oh, somebody loaded it to me or whatever. I said, this was what happened. I gave this book to my cousin, he lost and he brought this one and I took his, my mother was furious. He said, you mean your cousin, your lost book you gave to him and went and stole another person's own and brought and gave you and you kept it? You kept it? She was very angry. He ordered me to return the book for the boy to take back to school. You know, that's one of the values I had in life. Mm. One of the values I had in life. So, and that helped me all through life. And that's also what the values I'm trying to instill in my children. So my parents were my mentors. And then my uncle, my maternal uncle, who had to fund my university education because my parents could not afford that. Who, when he heard that I was going to read law, Mr. Chief Sonny Okoye, he said, what? Say he was going to take responsibility. So he sponsored my education, my my studies in the in the in the university as a lawyer, and also 
my in the in the, in the law school. So these are my mentors. Now coming out to the to the among lawyers, when I started practice in those after being called to the bar, in those days uh, when we were in in, in Limo State then, where I used to go to court, as Mike Ahamba, Chief Mike Ahamba, he was not a senior advocate then, but later he became a senior advocate. Very handsome man, very, you know, very good, you know, very eloquent speaker. And I used to like watching him in court. All right, sir. Thank you. It's good ha to have this very, very insightful and interesting chat with you on your experience while you were here as a participant at the National Institute, sir. Thank you for your time. We hope that when next we need you, you avail us your time, sir. It's new. It's fresh. It's all about policies and strategies. Watch out for NIPS Policy TV programs on NTA News 24. Tune in on Mondays, Tuesdays, Fridays and Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. on DSTV Channel 419, Go TV Channel 26, Star Times Channels 101 and 433, and Free TV Channel 703. Miss this and miss out on policies that will affect you and our country. Join us. Keep watching. Keep watching. Keep watching NIPS Policy TV. The development of national ethics and integrity policy by ICPC with its partners and its subsequent approval for implementation represents a significant milestone in Nigeria's quest for a national rebirth that will introduce value reorientation, accountability, and transparency not only in governance but in our everyday life and dealings with other people around us. It should also recondition its citizens to work for national development while encouraging them to cultivate respect and love for fellow citizens. With this policy in operation, selfishness, violence, disunity, and ineffective governance would be a thing of the past for Nigeria to take its pride of place in the Committee of Nations. That's all we have on the program today. Hope you will join us next time. Till I come your way again, I am Chana Ejaga. Bye for now.